Hi, I'm Jed Bodwin, and I'm here with Denny Tedesco, uh, director, creative mind behind the film The Wrecking Crew. Creative mind, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I think the, the first question, may, probably for a lot of people, is um, tell us about how this started, because this started in part with you wanting to tell the story of, of your father, Tommy sure. Tedesco. And then, sure, I mean, yeah. I, s I always, w I mean, I always grew up knowing my dad went, you know, he was a studio musician, and I uh, always felt like it's a pretty cool story, and I always knew that I wanted to tell the story of my father, and then he had a stroke. And then it came where it was like he had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. And I, I, the thought of this came the other day is, if he didn't been diagnosed with cancer, and not regular cancer, but cancer, would I have jumped? I don't know. You know, because there's something about, terminal is like, yeah, that's, that's it, you're done, you know, we better jump on this now. And it was like, I didn't want that to be my regret in life, is I wanted to tell that story and I should have, and I don't want to be, I should have. So I started telling the story, I put Dad at a round table uh, in a studio with Hal Blaine, the drummer, and Carol Kay, the bass player, and Plaz Johnson, sax man. And I kind of based it on Broadway Danny Rose, which is kind of how I knew musicians, because I never saw my father go to work and play. It just saw my, all these guys always talk about things, and that's kind of what, what I liked about Broadway Danny Rose. So I just let him talk for you know the first session. Yeah. And to kind of set the stage for this, now these are, these are musicians who were not necessarily like, you know, like the name to people who weren't playing, but among people no. who played, and I heard uh, in an interview with somebody saying, you know, in the 60s, people used to joke that their three favorite drummers were Hal Blaine, Hal Blaine, Hal Blaine. Yeah, yeah. And, and your dad, too, very renowned among musicians. Yeah. Well, it's funny, because that's what someone, you know, the other day in a screening, someone asked, well, there was a couple things that were asked were crazy, but one of them was, which wasn't crazy, were they upset that they weren't stars? And, but they were stars. They were stars among the stars. So if they were on the session, you know, if Cher was there or, or let's say Nancy Sinatra, they were happy to go, oh, thank God Hal Blaine's there and Don Randy and Tommy Tedesco there. They're thankful. They would move sessions to know, you know, to other days if they couldn't get those guys. And, and among the peers, they were gods, you know, especially with, you know, those, when I say gods, you know what I mean? Musicians love musicians. And there's a group of musicians, when you know there's a hot musician, they all have that respect for those people. And I think they were the stars, so. Yeah. Um, so they were never, you know, they were never exploited. You know, you know it, it wasn't like other, maybe other cities where they didn't get paid. These guys got paid well. They were double scale, sometimes triple scale if you could pull it off, you know. And uh, that's what it was, you know. They were in demand. Yeah. One of the things that, um I think I first encountered your dad's work. He was actually a columnist for Guitar Player magazine. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you're a guitar player. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, you're more than I am. Yeah. But, um, I bet you got three chords down more than I got. <laughs> but he had this, this wonderful column, uh, Studio Log. Studio Log, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the thing I remember about that was all these other guys would, you know, they'd, they'd have in their columns, like, you know, go practice these licks. Yeah, yeah. And he would always talk about what it was like to be a working musician. Yeah. And there were these powerful lessons that went beyond just being yeah. a musician. He, yeah, exactly. Well, it was interesting because when he was a uh, guitar player magazine, actually just came out with a book, the early years of Guitar Player magazine, they talked about that. You know, they talked about when they approached him for that. You know, he said, well, I can't write. You know, I'm not one of those guys that you're talking about. They said, no, just write what you want to, you know, write about. And he thought, all right, I'll do it like this. He was going to write exactly what everybody asked them these questions. What do you do? You know, how much do you get paid? What do you, you know, what do you play? Da, da, da. So he thought, all right, the date, the, the session, it was John Williams' session, whatever the movie was, Temple of Doom. John Williams, the composer, instruments played, the, uh, you know, um, electric, uh, what was it, the electric uh, sitar, whatever he was playing, and how much money he made, you know, $1,500.32. Or three, or maybe <laughs> nothing sometimes, and he would always do those, you know, articles, and they were always had a tongue in cheek to it, but there was always, like you said, a learning something learning curve about it, and that is the greatest thing is now meeting these other musicians, other musicians, musicians 
that come to me and say, my fa you know, your father said, taught me so much in these articles, or little things, you know. Um, but is, it, that's been, but you don't know is in those days when mom was doing the, mom would have to type them out. So <laughs> this, is this is like 1977, 78, 79. No, I, you know, we had an IBM typewriter and dad would wait basically all through the months. He would take music and from a session and say, hey, John, can I use this? I'm going to write an article or horn or whatever it was. Yeah, 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 go ahead. Take the music, which was illegal. You know, when do you think about that? The copyist would have been very upset. Put it, you know, and fold it up, put his guitar, and he'd write an article. And, um, but he would always decide at the last minute what he was going to write. And he would sometimes, you know, and he would sit there with my mom and go, okay, here we go. And he'd start talking like I'm talking. And then he'd, after maybe a minute, go, yeah, no, 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 let's do it again. And she'd rip out the piece of paper. And it, I always said they were always fighting their whole lives, but this was the guaranteed fight. <laughs> so just, te -te -te -te. and it was horrible, but, but it was always a good article. You know, he would show you sometimes, you know, how to read music, or not read music, but he would show you what he did on a, you know, he would say, can we swear on this? <laughs> but he would say, you know, there was like that stuff that he would say, scare the shit out of someone, but then he would give you something else that, you know, it, you didn't have to be an expert to know, right. so. Yeah. Now, um, <clears throat> the other thing, too, is, is maybe today, I don't know that we have a, a, a kind of uh, group of musicians like the Wrecking Crew. You know, there's, uh, there's, there's always great session players. There's, you know, there's Leela Scalar is still working. Dean Parks is still working. Uh, Tom Rattel is still working. There's a lot of guys still working. And then Abe Laboreal Jr., is, oh, you know, yeah. hell of a drummer. Yeah. There's all those guys still doing it, but they're different. And it's not because they're not doing what my father and those guys had to do. When my father was working in the early 60s doing the rock and roll dates, they were replacing whole bands. They were doing whole recordings in a day because that's how the business was. You know, and it was Earl Palmer that said around the 70s, it wasn't recording dates, they were recording projects. You know, where you could do weeks on end on a certain album, you know. Um, uh, Stevie, um, Stevie Van Zandt said to me the other day, it was really interesting, he said, you know, you realize the music these guys were doing, you know, that lasted 50, 60 years, some of this stuff, are classics. And, you know, all the way around, playing, recording, producing, arranging, everything. Those things were done in one to two, three hours sometimes. You know, he says, from, you know, from beginning to mix, he says, if I had to do that in a week, I'd be in a panic, you know, and we have all the tools and all the great musicians. It's just a different animal now. You know, not having those tools made those guys have to do it like that. Because you could never, and that was the thing, is you could never afford to make an album if it took a week, two weeks right. with those guys in the studio. It would never have worked. You wouldn't have a business. You know, the business was kind of radio push the labels, the labels you know, hired the musicians and hits became, you know, it was just this thing that fed off each other. Top 40 radio. Hey, new hit out. Let's, you know, let's go this way. Beatles come out. Let's go this way. Folk goes, let's go this way. Horn section, this way. You know, everything was kind of marketing and everything else. This is one of the things that comes up in the film, too, is I, I think it's Earl who says that he wasn't necessarily a rock guy. No, uh, no, he was a jazz guy. Yeah, you know, from from you know he's doing rhythm and blues out of New Orleans. You know he got it hooked into, you know doing, um, um, oh God, Fats Domino and Little Richard. That was his thing, and he had to move out of New Orleans because he was married to a white woman, so that wasn't going down too well in the fifties. Yeah, and um, so he moved to L.A. and got into A and R and then started doing sessions for Specialty. I think it was. And then he started getting really busy, and then he turned Hal on, Hal Blaine on, you know, to gigs when he couldn't do it, and that's how it started going. But my dad wasn't a big fan of rock and roll. You know, my dad was a big fan of getting, going to work and getting paid and doing <laughs> something he loved to do and play guitar. Yeah. You know, he had a great um, uh, philosophy of it. He said, listen, there's music and there's the music business. Sometimes they mix. But, you know, I play for smiles. If the guy's not smiling, I got to keep on doing something or he's, he's going to not hire me again. 
And that's what he did. He would always keep, you know, it didn't matter if he felt it was wrong. If he, if he felt this is what the guy wants, I got to play it, you know. There was a great uh, story that, you remember Larry Carlton, the wonderful, yeah. great guitarist? And Larry was like, you know, Larry comes into the 70s, late 60s, early 70s. Larry's the king. He's the next Tommy Tedesco, in a sense. And uh, they're on a TV date and recording in you know, this rock thing comes across, you know, it's like, so my father gives it to Larry to play, you know, this is his thing. And Larry plays, he said, this beautiful rock thing, beautiful rock solo. And the, and the leader was like, no, 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 that's all wrong, that's wrong, wrong, wrong. And my father instantly knew what was the problem. Because the leader thinks rock is bad. <laughs> you know, he's an old guy. He comes from a different school of what it's, he said, but what Larry just played was gorgeous. It was a gorgeous rock solo. It was everything contemporary. It was beautiful. It was right on. But he, he give it to me. I'll show you how to play it. And he turned it up and just gave a god awful solo. You know, just you know, ramped it up to ten and just you know, awful. And the guy says, Yeah, that's it. But he was playing for that guy. That's what he was there for. It didn't mean it was the best. It was, but it was for the best for that guy. He was using philosophy again. Yeah. One of the things uh, in the film, tell us about this, this song that your dad wound up performing on the, on the gong show. Oh, <laughs> well that was actually, that came, that's funny because that actually comes off of, it was called the Requiem to a Studio Guitar Player. Um, every year, Neris, um, which is the National Academy of Coordinating Arts and Sciences, wow, I got it in one shot. Yes, I got that. Um, they would, you know, they would, in locally, they would give awards out every year, you know, the, the guitar player or the bass player and the drummer. And like five years in a row, Dad got the same, you know, he was always getting the same, you know, award, which was phenomenal. You know, it was all nominated by your peers. That one year, though, Larry got it. So he <laughs> came to, at the awards ceremony, my father decided to dress up in a ballerina, as a ballerina, and play this guitar. And he wrote a song called Requiem to a for a studio guitar player. And he went through this whole cast of characters. It was an inside joke among guitar players. You know, I saw Barney Kessel, who's one of the greats, you know, bite the dust. I saw Herb Ellis feel the pain. I saw how Roberts get into a teaching game. And he went to talk about Larry Carlton and Zapp and all these guys. So they took that song and he went on the gong show. Just the beginning part. And he said, in the 50s, I was something. In the 60s, I was like a king. But in the 70s, rolled around, I'll do just about anything. And, that, and he starts playing, and that's it. He did it as a joke. And he ended up, you know, he won, won the gong show that, <laughs> that day. <laughs> so, but he said, you know, he, he, you know, he swung it around. He, got, he says, I got $500, or no, it was at $334 for winning. And then he got a shower massage. And then he wrote the song, so he got BMI on top of that. So he made sure of it. And in the in the film, of course, uh, Frank Zappa talks about him. And yeah. that's a guy who did not, uh, well, you know, suffer fools. Let's it, say. It, it's funny. It's so weird the timing you're asking this question because I'm trying to get a Zappa song from Lumpy Gravy, a piece of uh, for the DVD. And I just talked to one of his the folks over there, and they just saw the movie. And they didn't even know Frank was in it. And they said, what, where was that from? I said, that was from when I did this thing we did in college. For, you know, when I was in college, my friend John wanted to do this, um, you know, the documentary about guys like my father, cinematographers, choreographers, folks that are well-respected among their peers. So he said, let's do it on your dad. And I said, okay. And, and we were in college. You know, it wasn't that great. You know, but what came out of it was, you know, great footage from those seminars of my dad and, and this one piece with with Zappa. And I set it up by giving Frank, I said, could you take a look at this piece of him on the gong show? Well, I thought Frank was going to say something funny. Frank's not funny. He's very serious. <laughs> He's, I, didn't, I obviously didn't know anything about Frank Zappa. And um, so we, when he laid this, like, this thing down, I can't remember how he says, you know, basically, hey, just look past the costume and listen to the words. You know, it's about... And he was going a deeper and darker avenue. And, went, and when, when it happened, I went, oh, God, that sucked. You know, but then I realized when I was making this thing, you know, when I started cutting in 2006, I went, wow, 
Frank laid that out for me for 30 years later. Because now I could use it, and it kind of makes sense to be at the end of this movie. So that was, that was kind of where that came from. You know, by accident. A lot of by accidents. As you were, uh, you, you know, you kind of have the round table in the film with Carol Kay and, right. and, and all this cast of characters. Um, how did you go about assembling that particular group of people? That group was dead. I said, who do you think I should use? You know, I knew I wanted Hal, and he said Earl, Hal, Earl got sick. And, I, and he, he suggested um, Carol on bass and Plaza on sax, so you could have a horn and a bass. You know, and it's interesting because looking back, I, I, I don't think it would have been any different. You know, I would have, you know, could have picked anybody now. You know, now you look back, but no, I still would have stayed the same. Um, I always wanted it to be that round table all the way through, though. I wanted that round table to be every discussion I had. You know, like I said, based it on Broadway, Danny Rose. I wanted it to do that if I, you know, other sections. I kind of try to do it with um, the Gold Star engineers. Mm -hmm. Let them talk. You know, asking questions, and they just go with two cameras on dollies. And it helps because then you're a voyeur. I'm not an interviewer. You know, it's always better to have more than one, you know, especially if you can have two or three, you know, talking and let them have discussions, you know. But that was why I did it. As you were uh, beginning to make this, was there, was there kind of... Did you start hearing from people, say, who had, had been part of the Wrecking Crew, kind of said, you know, I'm... You know, hey, I'm willing to talk to you. you know. Yeah, you know, it's funny because, you know, the, the thing about the Wrecking Crew, you know, the name is really, comes out of Hal Blaine's book in a lot of ways. You know, no one really remembers it too much, you know, in the studios. Um, but it's stuck. And whether or not there's who's in it, well, I'm, we're basing it on... These are the guys that were doing the rock and roll stuff. Who were the Phil Spector guys that went on to do the Dan and Dean guy? Same stuff that did the Wilsons and the Lou Adlers and Herb Alpert, all that stuff. You see the same guys on the contracts. That's kind of how I based who was part of what. The hardest part is when you're doing this, like my editor in 2006, Claire Scanlon, she said, you have to stop interviewing people. She said, you'll never fall in love with anybody if we try to put everybody in. I said, well, I understand, and, but that's why God gave us DVDs. And I didn't listen to her, and I kept going all the way until last week. I actually did one more when I said it was over months ago. But I pulled another <laughs> one off. It was Michael Nesmith. Oh, wow. And the reason was I was, going, I was needing a Michael Nesmith song, and I needed to get permission. I thought, well, let's ask him if he'll do the interview at the same time. And he did. Um, and as of right now, as of yesterday, I turned in those outtakes. There's six hours of outtakes. And um, they're got, at first they flipped and then went, oh, wait a minute, we're doing Blu-ray, we're okay. It's good, because I want them on there. I want everybody's story, whether it's five minutes or ten minutes. I have highlights of different songs, like talking about Eve of Destruction or talking about California Dreaming or, or some obscure songs. Um, and then there's like, you know, the highlights of the drummers, highlights of the bass players, engineers. Everybody has something to say. Historically, I wanted it there. You know, someone said, well, why don't you do it, you know, like Wrecking Crew 2? I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> Just, you know, put it all on one. I'm going away. Goodbye. Do whatever you want with it. Historically, you can keep it. So, no, I just, I'm happy with the way it turned out. Yeah. Yeah, the the uh, this of course was uh, was going around to festivals and and cleaning up with with awards here at Tollgrass being yeah. being one of them. Um, were you? I mean, because right, we never know when we do something. Yeah, what the reaction is going to be. We can feel like it's good, but well, it was interesting. It, you know, that was the one of the most frustrating things was after you see it a few times and you see the reaction and you go. And that's not, listen, my film's easy. You know, I, you're dealing with 50% of the film is the music. If, you know, and most, a lot of the people that come to this, they're going to love the music anyways. It brings back memories. Right. It's a demographic. If you hit that certain demographic, unless you hate that music, you shouldn't be going there anyways. You know what I mean? So most likely you're going to love that part. So I kind of have that going for it. A lot of things fell into place for the film. The hard thing for me was after seeing the film play in audiences around the world. 
and getting the reaction it was getting, it was so frustrating. It's like, there's no distributors in these audiences, you know, and no one was touching us because we had so much back end to, you know, to pay off with the music and the licensing of stock footage, licensing of this, you know, forget about our money. We'll never see that. Let's just get that out. And that was the reality of the business. If the movie's going to cost us this much to, you know, license and, you know, pay off to distribute, but we're only going to make this much, why are we going to do this? You know, people don't understand. It's just the same thing as my father dealt with. There's music and there's the music business. There's movies in the mo movie business. How do those other films make it? Well, those have angels. They, you know, our angels were people, other than family and friends, real people that donated $10, $5, $1,000. You know, that's what we ended up having to do. The other day at a, um, when we opened in Los Angeles, in a Q&A, I said to, you know, this discussion came up and I said, if there's a distributor in, in this audience, I would highly recommend you watch films with an audience. Because how many times I was told this was a niche film? And I said, it's not a niche film. And I'm not saying because it was my doc. I was getting upset because it was like, I'm watching this film in Israel. I'm watching it in Barcelona. I'm watching it in England. I'm watching it in Wichita. I'm watching it in Buffalo. I'm watching everywhere. And again, I'm, even if you hate the film, why is it selling out? Why is it getting standing ovations? They love these musicians. They love the music. So that was the frustrating part. What was the answer? What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me going. <laughs> I can't even remember. Well, yeah, yeah I mean. Uh, I'm part of that <laughs> stubborn thing, right? <laughs> Don't get me going. With, with that, there's like this thing that I know other people who, who saw it here more than once. Right. Uh, and it's, it becomes like, it just becomes part of their vernacular. You know, for, for some yeah. people it's like uh, the Blues Brothers or Caddyshack or something like right. that. And for, for these people it's like it's the Wrecking Crew. It's like, you've got to see this movie. It, 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 that was the coolest thing. Um, you know, especially with musicians. Here's the thing about musicians. As much as I deplore the idea of people bootlegging, you know, what'd you see? They, someone come up to see my shirt or whatever and say, oh, I love the film. Really? Where'd you see it? Oh, I saw it on the such and such bus. Oh, I saw it on such and such tour. So, you know, it went from <laughs> Elton John flight to uh, Eagles uh, tour bus, you know, the guys, you know, the, you know, the roadies to the Paul Lanka bus. I thought, well, at least I'm going across demographics, you know. But musicians are great because they love to tell each other. And it is, it's, it's a fun kind of film. It's easy. Like I said, it's, you know. And the other things that happen by accident, I did not know it even probably when we showed it here in 2008. I was too early in his life. But watching this over the years, realizing the accidents that happened making the film or putting it together, Claire and I putting it together, you know, the one thing that happened is um, we already know about the music. That was going to be there. But the storylines, you know, people start relating to storylines that we didn't expect. The storyline, and when I asked everybody, I said, hey, um, Bones, you know, when you're at the top of the world, what happens when you're not at the top of the world? Now, every question I'm asking, I'm relating to my relationship where my father was. Because I remember after he had that stroke, where is he at mm -hmm. in his life? He was okay. I think we took it harder as kids than he did. He was okay with his life. But I remember Bones saying, you know, you get your ramp up. And you, you're at the top of the world, and then you got the ramp down. It's not about staying at the top. It's taking that ramp down as long as possible. And it's like being, it's being relevant in your life. You don't have to be a musician. You don't have to be a filmmaker. You don't have to. My mom's 84 years old. She wants to be relevant as a m mom, grandmother. You know what I mean? You want to be relevant in life. So those, I think when people are watching this film, they're you know, seeing themselves in it. The other thing was the storyline of me losing my father. Originally, that was never part of the story. Um, when I cut 30 minutes, we, Claire and I had cut 30 minutes in 2007, whatever it was, and a friend said, why are you cutting it like this? And we said, well, what do you mean? Well, you're cutting it like a History Channel doc. You're, any one of us could cut this thing. It's pretty straightforward. Mm. But you're not going after something that 
any one of us can touch, and that's your relationship, your insight to this, this storyline. And, and, and I was telling someone the other day, it was my ego that actually stopped me from doing that. Because I don't want to be that. I don't want to, I want to be a director. I want to be known for the director of the film, not the kid that did the film about his dad. Right. Do you know what I mean? And, yeah. and that's what I was concerned about. But I realized, listen, if this is going to have any, I re, and once we started playing with it and started working, I said, okay, we'll go with it. You know, then we start putting, and then, Someone would say, all right, well, where's the narrator? Where'd he go? All right, and come back, put another voice there. Kept going, and then someone said, too much narration. Okay, <laughs> pull it back. <laughs> you know, but I never was on camera. I was fine with that, you know. And, um, but what that did was relate, again, the audience relates to me losing a parent. A lot of people, if, you know, you can be 30 on. You're going to lose a parent. It's inevitable. You know, a lot of our, you know, people at the end of the screenings come in, you know, just you know, teary-eyed, you know, if not bawling sometimes because they, they've just gone through this with their own lives, their own family. So. Yeah, that was a, one of the things I was struck with in one of the, the Q&As that you did was, was uh, here was that somebody stood up and said something about, it wasn't even about the music, it was about, they said, wow, the work ethic of these guys. And the work ethic yeah. is so important to me. Yeah. That's funny you said that because thank you for saying that because that to me is if my dad didn't, you know, you like we were joking about you playing music, I don't play music. I didn't have a work ethic or any kind of, e not even ethic. I didn't have the patience to ever practice. You know, I didn't have, you know, so I quit a lot of things. But his work, those guys' work ethics, that's what got him to where they were. And that's what my dad taught me, was that work ethic. That's why I got to be this part, point in my life with this film, because I didn't want to quit. And the, when they went to work, they're coming out of World War II as kids. They're just lucky to be playing instruments. Mm -hmm. You know, in the film, we talk, my mom is interviewed, and she says, um, she talks about how they went to that dance at Niagara University. Someone said, oh, I got a friend that plays guitar, because they were losing the guitar player. So my dad auditioned that night, got on the next day, he's on the road with his big band going around the country. But he gets fired in Dallas, because the guy downsizes, finds a guitar player, slash, Singer, so he gets rid of two oh, to get no. one, just downside. <laughs> but my dad's so ashamed to go back to small town Niagara Falls, New York. He calls my mom, says, "Let's go to L.A. I, there's music. They make music out there." And I asked my mom recently. I said, "How long was it before you guys went? A year, year and a half?" She goes, "No, it was three day, uh, three weeks. It's three weeks. <laughs> By the time we got home, they packed up. You know, this is 1953. You know." can't imagine what kind of car. She tied everything to the car, cross Route 66, and not knowing what to expect. They're only 23, 22. You know, don't forget my father's not a seasoned, they're not seasoned anything. And I asked her, I said, was well, Dad working a lot? You know, in LA, not in L.A., in Niagara Falls as a musician. No, there's no work in Niagara Falls in 1953. A wedding once in a while, maybe. She said he got a job in Pennsylvania with a jazz trio, and he didn't want to go to the dance. And she says, you have to go to this dance. I spent $35 on this dress. That $35 changed my life, changed their lives, changed music, in a sense. Anything he touched changed. Because, you know, it's just being at the right place at the right time. But the work ethic, when he got to L.A., though, that's when it struck. You know, he didn't want to do, he didn't want to do labor, you know, he didn't want to be moving boxes. He, he was naturally lazy as a person when it came <laughs> to certain things, you know what I mean? Right. Um, but man, he, he studied that guitar inside out. You know, when they talk about him reading music the way he did and he was phenomenal, that's because he practiced it for hours. He would flip the music upside down, read it backwards so that he wouldn't memorize the parts. He would take trumpet books and read those, take sax books and read those. So he was able to transpose quickly and on, on the spot. But it was work ethic. Yeah. You know. As you've worked on this, uh, one thing I did want to touch on is, is of course, the 110 songs yeah. that appear in the film. I wasn't turned down by one. Not one song. And, I, and, and I'm still actually, last two days, 
Magnolia's getting all, oh, God, they're upset with me. The, guy, the <laughs> DVD guys, because they're going, you got to turn this in, you got to turn this in. I said, like, come on, I'm waiting for this one. <laughs> I'm waiting for, I got t 15 more songs I've had to get, you know, I'm spend, it's my money, I'm spending more money, but if we're going to make this date, blah, 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 you can't keep doing this. So he's like, I know, but just do something else. I'm giving you this stuff, this stuff is clear, go do something else. But I'm like, they're just, I'm still clearing songs for the DVD. You know, and so far, knock on wood, they've all come through. It would be a batting a thousand. So the kind of, just a couple of final things. Yeah. What was the thing that you had to cut from, from the film that was like the most painful Nothing. for you? Nothing. You know, it's weird because you always think that. Maybe because I don't think that anymore because once it's go it goes away, it's gone. Um, when we went, see 2008, when you guys saw the film, film then, it changed again when I was able to do another, uh, I shot Al Jardine and Peter Tork at a screening. He, they came to play in uh, San Francisco. So I took interviews from that and then incorporated that. I kept trying to get um, Liam Russell for years and he kept turning it down. And he said, oh, it's a bunch of bullshit. Blah, blah, blah. I said, okay, well, can you please? I know the name may be, but come on. And finally I gave up. And people would always say, I think even here, someone asked last time we were here, where's Leon? Why isn't Leon in? It's like, well, talk to Leon. You know, I tried. And then finally his guitar player, Pat Flynn, got him to do it. And it was like, thank God. Because Leon, is, to me, is like the, he's the cherry on top now. Have you seen it? I don't know yeah, if you've seen yeah, it. Yeah. He's like, he brings it home for me. You know, that was probably the most exciting thing to see that then, but then my fear was showing it now with Leon. It's like, now you're showing a new, a new cut. Is it going to be okay? And once I saw it with the audience, I was like, oh, thank God, because it's he's funny. Yeah. He doesn't mean to be, but he's funny. He's awesome. But I didn't have to leave anything out. I'm, I'm, I'm being honest because it's all on the DVD. If you ask me, you know, if I if they wouldn't allow me to put a DVD together, then I'd be upset. You know, I've been feeding people outtakes for years just to keep them coming. You know, building that audience. You know, from Wichita on, I kept building email addresses. That's why we have almost sixty thousand Facebook fans today, because we just kept, you know, come on, join us, <laughs> join us, join this cult we call Wrecking Crew. <laughs> Send your money. We so, have classes too. <laughs> when you started this, were you were you somebody who was kind of Comfortable going out and making new friends, or was this a? I'm, yeah, <laughs> I'm always. I don't like selling. I don't like selling. I hate selling. I suck at selling. My ba uh, my This is my. I uh, can't wait to tell these guys. My greatest success story in the last year. All right, so we for all the things we started doing. It was donations started after 2010 when it was when I realized there was no way any money was coming in. We're gonna figure out another way. And I went to different companies. I went to Fender. I went to Ludwig. They all, you know, they're all nothing. You know, all I was asking for literally was like ten, twenty thousand dollars, which is an ad in a magazine. Right. I said, take a chapter. I want you to sponsor that DVD chapter of guitars. You know, you hit the Fender button. They no one. But what came out of it was one guy said, "I'll give you a thousand dollars now for a dedication." I said, "What are you talking about?" He said, have a dedication chapter. All the songs, people, let them dedicate for $1,000. Let them put on their, on the website, on the website and on the DVD, a dedication. So be my baby, blah, 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 blah. And you know, all these songs. Um, so Good Vibrations, and all these songs, not all of them, but people would donate $1,000. And it was really amazing, actually, how many people actually did that. And, but then there's songs that, you know, you're just not going to get anybody. <laughs> you, like, there was, the, you know, a great example was um, um, Gary Lewis. You know, everybody loves a clown. How are you going to dedicate that to your wife? You know, it's not, it's not an easy <laughs> sell. And I thought, damn, this is a good song, though. I thought, I'm going to figure this out. And just before we finalized the, the thing, I went, I call the clown school. I called the clown school in Los Angeles and I pitched the guy and the guy says, that's a great pitch, that's a great idea, I'm in. 
thousand dollars. And it in the in the act, so it says, uh, you know, dedicated by the clown school. And his dedication was everybody's a clown. But it was I was more thrilled about the fact that I sold something <laughs> than the actual movie anymore. But it was the way it was coming up with ideas. How to get this film out? How am I going to make this money? You know, you know that. You know, I just one day we'll make our money back. But it was like, how do we pay the bills to get it out? You know, and that's how we did it. Coming up with different ideas. So uh, now we have the the theatrical release, and we'll see the DVD, Blu-ray. Yeah. And eventually it's, the soundtrack. Yeah, the soundtrack's happening right now. We have uh, a four CD soundtrack. Three CDs are filled with the hits. And the fourth CD is songs under the guy's own names. So it was like under my dad or, or um, Don Randy and Hal Blaine, Lyle Ritz, all these different musicians had their own stuff. Whether some of it's rock, some of it's blues, some of it's jazz, some of it's classical. It's really cool because now they get to have their you know, stuff heard. Then there's another book called Sound Explosion. Um, behind it, it's basically interviews that Ken Sharp did, who's a writer, great writer, and he did a um, tabletop book. It's gorgeous, it's 12 by inch, you know, like a, uh, what do you call it, LP. Right. And it's 300 pages. Oh, wow. And it's interviews straight from, you know, it, Brian Wilson and everybody, all these guys, engineers. So, I mean, we're trying to like, you know, keep it going. We're, uh, we were number one on iTunes for about two weeks. And then we got knocked out by the film I Antarctica I know, what can I say? <laughs> penguins. <laughs> no. ah, penguins. Damn it, those penguins. Um, can you go back and do an edit with maybe a couple with penguins? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't believe me. I will. Don't. Okay, let's go down. Let go get a penguin suit. Where can we get one in Wichita? Um, damn, that's a good idea. <laughs> it's like, it's the penguin at the end, the crying penguin. Yeah, I'll do it. Okay. I'm on it. <laughs> We'll shoot in black and white. A little artsy. Yeah. Black, white, black, white. Bring a zebra. <laughs> <laughs> so, so <clears throat> at what point then do you kind of, uh, what, do you, what do you do next? Do you, do you see yourself doing another film? Or you yeah, I mean, I, I could always see myself. I, I, you know, I produced other things, you know, like videos or whatever comes up. Um, you know, I just, I, I, I would love to do something, you know, it sounds crazy, but Something I wanted to do something where my kids it's going to affect my kids' life. You know, I live in California where there's like water. You know, it's a desert, and I was in Palm Springs the other day and went, "Oh my God, these people have lawns everywhere." I mean, I'm guilty, but there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of lawn there. Um, but I just feel like there's something I got to do something that's. I don't want, it just sounds like I don't want to say worthwhile. Um, What's the, you know what I mean? I, it sounds like I'm, I haven't done something worthwhile making the ranking crew. I'm not saying that because it brought a lot of, you know, uh, I just want something that's going to, for my kids' future, you know, their kids' future, you know, whether I, you know, I campaign for water <laughs> conservation. I don't know. We've got to figure something out. Why, well, you got something, John? <laughs> got something going? <laughs> I'm up for it. <laughs> Um, maybe I'll check out the clown school. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> I could market for them. No, no. I, I mean, I, I thought about going into marketing because I had so much fun doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, coming up with ideas. You know, it's it's fun. I just you know, but I do love meeting people. You know, I think that's the best part about this film was going around. That's the hardest part. It's like now it's like wow, I don't have to go to these screenings. And that's no fun anymore because I really enjoy meeting people, right? And seeing their reaction. So, well, uh, without sounding too uh, too Pollyannish or, or anything like that, you know, a lot of people say who come out of a situation like you have where they've worked so hard. You know, the thing I hear from them again is, again and again, is I I made what I, I said I I made what I set out to do. I, I made the movie I wanted to see. I made the music I wanted to hear. I did. You yeah. Know, uh, don't give up on those things that matter to you. Is that kind of where you're at? Um, the film took a lot out of me. Mm -hmm. You know, it really did take a lot out of me. And that's, um, 
that's something that, you know, I think when it got to that point of 2010 and we had crossed, you know, because at that point I did everything you're not supposed to do, mortgaged and oh. do all the credit cards and all that stuff, but that was the only way to keep it going. Yeah. And what do you do? Not take a chance to interview Brian Wilson, you know, on film? I'm going to do it. Well, you know, but then it got to that point where, all right, now what? We crossed that line. Um, a great director, uh, Ali Salim, who did Sweetland, he's a friend, and he, his film <laughs> took 15 years. And I remember him saying that at 10 years, I'm oh God, I'll never get that far. God help me. <laughs> you know, but he said something, he said, you crossed that line where you went, uh-oh, we went too far. Or what do we do now? Either keep going or just stop. And we crossed that line twice. 2006, when Susie, my wife, God bless her, we said, let's cut this film. We gotta cut it. If we don't have cut it, we're, we got nothing. And until we cut it, we don't know if we have something. So we ended up cutting it, and then we got into the film festival. It did very, very well. But it was, again, it's one thing. And, it, and I remember people say, you did it, you did it, you did it. And I was like, no, I didn't do it. Yeah, I got great, yeah, I got awards. But that, that's not what I was going for. I want this out there, mm -hmm. you know, you know, to be commercially out there, not just to, you know, show it to a handful of people. So it, that 2010, it was very depressing to know we had gotten somewhere. And now what do we do? Well, we got to go that next step. Well, that next step took a lot out of me, a lot out of my family. Um, I was away a lot, trying to keep it going. Um, you, I didn't learn how he, he, you know, it's no different than Plaz Johnson saying in the movie, I'm a better grandfather than a father. Because he spent all that time doing it, as my father did. Uh, we, they all had that work ethic. We got to make sure we got food on the table for the kids. And that's what I had in my mind. My mind is, I got to get this thing out there. I have to, I have to f finish this thing, you know. What, and it was only about two weeks ago when I was literally in New York City. You know, they flew me to New York to do press and on serious radio and stuff. And I remember walking to the radio station and went, wow, this is the first time I really felt we did it. You know, as much as everybody said, oh, you did it, you did it. No, no, no. It was now because it was out of my hands. It's in Magnolia's hands. You know, it was only supposed to be in five theaters. It's in 120 now. You know, it's going crazy on iTunes, going crazy on VOD. We did it. We said, you know, I feel, I'm proud of what we did. It wasn't just making the film. I was proud that we all, you know, if it wasn't people, you know, everybody from here. Mm -hmm. I'm not kissing up to what, you, you know, tall grass, but it's true. You know, all those times, a couple times that they brought me out to show the film or talk, those things kept me going. You know, different festivals or different, or just people email me and say, man, you really made a great film. Or really inspired me. Your father did this, you know, telling me stories about what my father did over the years to help them, you know, because they'd seen the film and it brought back a memory of that. And that was really cool. So I think that's where um, I'm at now, you know. So we did it. Cool. Well, thank yeah. you so much for your time, Dave. Thank you.